thank you, Professor Barry, for a very um, theoretical and empirically rich study of the problem of um, collective action, and also really some practical advice on how one should proceed uh, with collective action. Um, we will have about um, half an hour to 35 minutes of uh, Q&A, um, because this session is recorded for the Hong Siu Chin series. Um, I will ask that uh, before you uh, raise your question, to please use the mic that's in front of you, uh, press on the button there, and um, tell us who you are and what is your affiliation. And please do keep your comments or your questions short so that other people will have the chance uh, to ask questions. Um, so I'm opening the floor now for uh, many questions that you might have. Evelyn Go, Australian National University. Uh, John, thank you so much for a wide-ranging and ultimately optimistic take on collective action, I think, which is a nice change for those of us who work on, on the area. Um, and my question has to do with that optimism. Um, for those of us who work particularly in the Asian context, who would take to heart what you're saying about a little, you know, a little bit of limited success being better than none at all. Um, the question sometimes arises about how much that limited success is the end point. Um, and what do we do in those situations? And I, in, in this context, I think about, well, the Mekong, if, if we need an example. Um, you know, the, the Mekong Agreement, as, as we all know, the new agreement is, is a very limited one indeed. And one that has, for the less optimistic of us, served to actually impede any possibility of the renegotiation wholesale of a much more inclusive, relevant and updated collective action agreement that is necessary if one wants to address many of the um, water management problems in the whole of the Mekong Basin. Um, you know, in, in the face of that sort of, sort of slightly depressing examples, um, what would you recommend? Thank you. No, I think your point is, is fair, and I, uh, earlier today in a session preceding uh, my talk, um, I received the same kind of criticism for uh, maybe gilding, gilding a lily too much. Um, I, I, I would have to concede that my optimism is relative to the very gloomy predictions that most game theory would have suggested about collective action. Uh, we have seen voluntary compliance on a scale that doesn't make rational sense. We should have seen much more free riding on the num I, I'm not talking just about river basins. I'm talking about a number of international actions or regional actions, even sub subnational actions uh, that simply can't be explained through rational actor models. People are behaving, quote, altruistically. So I am optimistic to that extent, but I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, uh, and I think some of my colleagues who are with me this morning would, would also appreciate it. Uh, I, I think there was a term used for this kind of process that I see as self-reinforcing is simply cycling. It's like sitting on a stationary bike and spinning a wheel, and ultimately you haven't moved an inch. Uh, but you've had good exercise. <laughs> um, so I, I recognize I recognize that risk, but you know if you think back, say to the end of the Second World War when we had a, an international system in almost total disarray, uh, I think there's been surprising progress made on a number of issues. When we think about climate change in the environment, I am certainly one of those who think thinks the clock is ticking and ticking very quickly. And, and so my message isn't, doesn't deliver much comfort if, if you say, you know, two degrees Celsius warming and anything over that is, is going to put us over tipping points from which we will never recover. And we've got 10 years, 15 years to deal with it. I don't, I don't think I have very optimistic uh, uh, advice. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if we're going to respond. I really don't. I, I've seen, I was rather disappointed that uh, President Obama in his first term, when it was, it was, a, it was a small, 
small issue, but big when you consider the U.S. role in production of greenhouse gas, uh, was looking for a carbon trading system in the United States, and he had, he had bipartisan support. And he moved a different part of his agenda, which was uh, uh, his Affordable Health Act. And he lost his bipartisan support on uh, carbon trading. Uh, I think that was a, I, I won't question his judgment. He thought he had different priorities. But we lost about eight years. Now we're going to Paris, and I don't know what's, whether anything productive is going to come out of that. So I'm quite pessimistic in some ways. But we have, for problems that have a, a longer clock, uh, we have made some progress, and uh, more than I ever would have ex expected. Um, if uh, any more questions, um, oh, okay, me. Not on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pishaman Yopantong, University of New South Wales, Australia. I wanted to pick up on kind of the similar issue that Evelyn raised as well. But so, how do we know that we're seeing positive unilateralism when we're seeing positive unilateralism? How can we make sure that it's not simply the pursuit of narrow self-interests? Because I'm thinking in particular to the case of China, where you have the Chinese government, for instance, saying that they're going to pursue self-governance, um, for instance, so cleaning up their backyard first before actually making a move to contribute to the global commons or so on. But so how can we be sure that's not simply their way of just, you know, excusing themselves from responsibilities? Certainly. I, I certainly see enlightened self-interest as being probably uh, key, that there will be, define your arena, what we'll say the nation, China, uh, it could be a state, it could be any, any political unit you want, that there are going to be internal pressures to take measures that could facilitate collective action in the future. And it would be out of enlightened uh, self-interest. Uh, politicians under pressure. I mean, I, I sense in China, I may be wrong, I don't, I don't work in China, that there is building pressure inside China for environmental cleanup, uh, particularly air. And it's hard just to clean up the air. Uh, and, and so rather than responding to pressures from the international community to get China to adhere to international understandings and conventions, it's responding to its own people. Now, in the, in the process, I don't know if this will happen, in the process, it may begin to set a certain number of standards or establish some regional best practice that then becomes meaningful uh, if there are regional accords, uh, regional efforts, maybe carbon trading, I don't know. Uh, but they will have established something. Uh, we, we know it when it comes to water that the, the nastiest issues always deal with allocation. Mm -hmm. And the, the criteria that are always trotted forward, and reasonably so, for determining allocation is current use. Current use simply reflects current technology. So what if somebody in the river basin, in the Mekong, or the Nile, or the Danube, or the Rhine, establishes best practice for use that is much more efficient than any, anything else in the basin? It's going to be hard for the other players to say, oh no, our, our current use is sacrosanct. Uh, we use so many cubic meters of water per hectare per year to produce X. And that's what we need. When your neighbor is producing X with one third the amount of water. Now I raise the example of uh, Israel and the Palestinians because I, I recognize immediately the Israelis can demonstrate that. They're, they're very water efficient in, in many ways in their agricultural sector. But they do it at a capital intensity that uh, Palestine isn't capable of. So there's, there's always that issue, but showing best practice in, the, in, a, in an area that is seeking some kind of collective action may, may be a bridge to solving some of the allocation problems or setting norms that would determine allocations. Deal? 
Uh, Dale Whittington from University of North Carolina. Um, John, I, I'd like to ask for your assessment of the international dispute resolution mechanisms and the quality of them. And, and let me make it specific. I mean, if the Nile Basin riparians came to you and, and said, um, who should we use uh, to uh, adjudicate our disputes? What, what would you recommend? I mean, wh where do we stand today on um, help, you know, for riparians? Yeah, I, you know, I haven't seen, I mean, I'm not directly familiar with successful international mediation maybe outside the Indus in, in 1960, and that was basically World Bank. Um, I, I w there was a case in Ethiopia uh, back in the early 90s, but it, it, it was a, a scheme, as I recall, where the Ethiopians wanted to irrigate a certain amount of acreage to settle demobilized uh, soldiers from their Revolutionary Front. This was Zanawi's supporters, and they had to get Egypt's acceptance. It had some potential to affect downstream flow, and I believe the World Bank put together a, a committee of experts. But it was such a minor uh, amount of water that it was easily resolved. I just don't. Ha I don't have enough cases from my own knowledge to to really answer that. I mean, I, I think the World Bank at one point hoped that it could set up that kind of mechanism that an upstream state or anyone affecting the supply of water to another riparian would have to notify the riparian. The riparian would have the chance to object. If they could not resolve the protest, then you would mobilize a committee of experts and the committee of experts and somehow would try to find a, a compromise. But I, I, I just haven't seen real examples of it. Chen Kang from Air Quiet School. The overall contribution to the public good, or in this case, international public good, uh, sometimes can be simply just add up like the uh, reduction of the greenhouse gas emission, or sometimes subject to the so-called weakest, weakest link. So the overall contribution uh, equal to the, the smallest contribution, and sometimes equal to the, the, the largest one. And in a threshold situation, that it depends on whether it passed certain threshold, then you have the benefit to the people. Uh, this is, is uh, these are called uh, aggregation technology. Okay, uh, I would be. Uh, I'm not directly familiar with the mm. the conceptual framework, so I, I don't think I'm going to say what I, I don't really know. Uh, what what would your I, 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 I don't know because uh, I think I saw his work up to like uh, 10 years ago and after that I, I don't see any other work. So I, I, in, you are in the fear. I, I, I thought I, you would know. The, the, something that comes to mind, I, which I mentioned in my talk, is the, uh, the, the decline in greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions in certain areas, which hasn't been uh, the result directly of Kyoto or collective action in that sense. It's been the result of maybe aggregate behavior due to the economic downturn after 2008. The European economic machine is simply turning at a much lower level than it had been previous to that. And so uh, energy consumption and emissions has, has gone down. It's, a, it's an aggregate action. It isn't part of the Kyoto framework. It's kind of an involuntary response. But the result has been in favor of um, what the collective action was, was seeking, a, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, um, Mark Julin from Duke University. Um, where would you put fear of getting locked in to a bad agreement in terms of ob obstacles to commitment? And the reason I ask is, um, some of your comments about compliance suggest that if an agreement is a, a bad agreement, then there will be reason to defect from that agreement, to break the agreement. But 
many times we actually didn't see that actors actually get stuck into bad agreements and that these agreements may be remarkably resilient for other reasons. Um, so what would you say about that? I think there's always a, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's almost a truism. There's a, always a strong bias towards the status quo. Um, committing to a, an agreement is a step into the unknown. Uh, we talked earlier this morning about trust and how trust may be established or is it necessary? Does it precede an agreement or does it flow from an agreement through observed behavior? Uh, but when you're on the brink, when you're trying to decide whether to commit or not commit, I think there's always a, at least we know, we know the status quo. Uh, we know, we may not like it very much, but it's known to us, it's, it's a familiar, and, and uh, yeah, those risks uh, of, of commitment to an agreement that may turn out to be bad may prevent us from ever taking the, the step. Um, I don't, again, I, I don't have examples of really bad agreements that leap to mind, uh, at least not in areas of collective action that I'm familiar with. Uh, maybe because I like to read more about the success stories than about the failures, but the, the Montreal uh, Protocol on ozone uh, it makes for good reading. Uh, you know, it, it works, it's a good agreement. I'd say law of seas, even though the United States has not ever ratified it, uh, is, a, is a good agreement. Uh, so I tend to focus on ones that work to a certain extent, seem to, seem to benefit um, their adherence. Uh, do, you, do you know some that, did, that are pure lousy? Well, so I mean, one example might be the Colorado River. Right, where there's you know clearly a lot less water in that river now than there was when that agreement was made. Um, certain states in the U.S. benefit a lot from that agreement, and others don't. And yet, it's you know remarkably persistent, and that's because the legal system kind of upholds that that agreement. Um, yeah, that's one example. Another agreement that you might think about as as sort of potentially being lousy from perspective of countries as they look forward is the, the 1959 Nile Waters Agreement, um, which locks Sudan into a certain position. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Colorado is interesting, and I, I, I don't know how the Mexican policymaking process actually works, but I'm, my guess would be that this conforms to what I was talking about, benefits accruing in, a, in domains pretty distant from the collective action domain, that Mexico has enough fish to fry with the United States on a whole range of other issues, from free trade agreement to investment, access to markets, uh, that it holds its nose and accepts a lousy deal on the Colorado um, because it it's not worth having a spat with the United States when there, when there are all these other, perhaps bigger issues. I'm guessing. I, I, don't, I really don't know how the Mexicans go about this process. 59, uh, you know, from a Sudanese point of view, I, I uh, wanted to raise this this morning. When you look at what 59 did for Sudan, until 1959, Sudan had a claim to 4 billion cubic meters of water. Egypt had 48 billion cubic meters of water under the 1929 agreement, all based on seasonal storage, so it was a different calculus. Then Sudan gets not 4 billion, but 18.5 billion cubic meters. This is 1959, before, you know, seven years before the Helsinki rules. It's as if somebody in the negotiations, and I, I don't know the stories of those negotiations, had equitable use in mind. And the Sudanese either asserted the right to the equitable, equitable use criterion or somebody did it for them. But they went from 4 billion to 18.5 billion cubic meters. That seems like a pretty good deal. I would have signed that agreement. And because they haven't used their share, at least that's my understanding until now, it, it, it's lasted. Uh, I, I had been expecting back in the 1970s 
that when Sudan pushed up against its 18.5, it might tear it up. But it's just never gotten there. Um, I'm Henry uh, from uh, Lincoln University, um, Oakland, USA. Um, I want to ask a, a question. Uh, um, it's about the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, two years ago, um, the uh, um, UN, uh, the um, uh, US, um, raised the uh, sanction issues on the uh, Sudan to, on, uh, regarding the Darfur um, massacre, and. Uh, uh, before that, uh, the uh, U.S. delegates already received the um, informations um, from Russia and China that uh, they object um, to the sanctions. Uh, so, but uh, you know, apply you know your theory, you know the sanctions and defections. Uh, why U.S. still push uh, the uh, sanctions in the Security Council? Uh, I don't know. It might. You know, there's part of me that would, that would cynically argue the U.S. felt it had to do something. Uh, this may have been more theatrical than than real. Although I know there were there were voices in the State Department that were passionate uh, about Darfur and the uh, abuses that they. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the abuses that were going on there, but. Uh, there, there was not going to be any military intervention by the United States. Uh, there was no, no taste for that whatsoever. Uh, so you do something that shows concern, um, maybe might have some, some effect. Uh, after all, the sanctions on Iran, I think, have been uh, quite painful to the Iranian economy and have brought about... Um, a greater willingness on the part of the Iranians to engage in negotiations over their nuclear program. So in, in context, in certain contexts, those sanctions seem to work. I had the sense in Sudan it was more theater than, than real. Um, a bit like um, uh, trying to try Omar Bashir in the, um, the Court of Criminal Justice. Uh, that was uh, a big gesture, but uh, I, don't, I don't think many people thought he was actually ever going to appear before that court. Strong? Yeah. Uh, hi, Prof. Um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. And uh, this is a question coming from somebody who does not have a water background. Um, sorry? Oh, my name is Sharini. I'm a research associate at uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School. Um, and I don't know much about water other than the interactions with the IWP colleagues who we share an office with. Um, but uh, from the, con the presentations I've heard this morning, uh, what strikes me is the question of actors um, in managing water disputes, so water issues. So in the beginning, we started off by saying that states are perhaps not monoliths. There are a lot of people involved in making decisions, and states consist of people. Then we had Scott Moore who said that civil society is very important. So he's like, this is a very important actor. Then we had the third one which talked about, I think the two presentations on Europe, which said that there are informal mechanisms which work and they have been success stories. Then we said those informal mechanisms may not work in Asia for a variety of other reasons. So we have a lot of actors. And so do you suggest that there should be any one specific actor who should be in the driver's seat? Or do you suggest that it's a case-by-case -case basis? That in some cases, informal actors may be a better actor and may actually have, be more effective. And in some cases, states may be more effective. So, so how, do, how does that play out and as a stakeholder analysis of water issues? Thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question, and you, you identified just about all the positions we heard earlier uh, today. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned, uh, and I still take the state quite seriously. I'm not, not prepared to write off the state as a decision-making unit. Uh, it's, uh, in my view, certainly if we're talking about international conventions and treaties, whatever the play of politics may be, someone at the sovereign level in a state has got to put their signature on it or not. You know, I mean, 
we could we can say that the the state may have eroded in certain ways, but there's still a a certain minimal level of stateness. So I mean, uh, when we're looking at international collective action problems, I still regard the state as the as the prime actor. Um, but all those other actors can be highly relevant. I think we, you know these cases were not theoretic cases. These were empirical cases we heard today on the Rhine and the Danube and uh, elsewhere, and uh, what Scott was presenting uh, in in the United States. And so, kind of the predictable interest groups. I think Scott was talking about rent seekers versus environmental activists who aren't in it for profit, uh, all having a, a stake in, in these issues and exerting, exerting pressure that can be meaningful. Uh, I was thinking when, when some of the presenters were presenting this morning of highly contrasted situations um, in the Middle East. When I was working on the Nile uh, for my last book, which came out over 10 years ago, in both Ethiopia and Egypt, it seemed to seem pretty clear to me that there was relatively little significant pressure from domestic lobbies on issues related to collective action in the Nile Basin, or its absence. There weren't lobbies in Egypt. There wasn't, for instance, the sugar producers lobby or the cotton producers lobby or uh, energy intensive industries that may have wanted to maximize power generation at the Aswan High Dam, pushing Egyptian policymakers in one direction or another. You couldn't find any evidence for it. They're there, I mean, th there are those actors, but I couldn't find any evidence for Egyptian policy on the Nile being shaped by domestic interests, except for specific government interests, the Ministry of Agriculture fighting it out with the Ministry of Power. Uh, it was kind of a classic thing that went on uh, for decades in Egypt. So it was within the confines of the government, but outside the government, nothing. So the subtitle of my book was National Determinants of Collective Action. The top guys made the decisions and that was policy. And it was the same in, in Ethiopia, as near as I could make out. There were bureaucratic fights, so bureaucratic interests got into the, the, the picture a bit. But even Meles Zanawi, this revolutionary leader with a big constituency back in his home province, I couldn't find any input from his supporters into policy on the Nile. It was in his head. But then you go to Israel and Palestine and Jordan in the Jordan Basin, and I think agricultural interests are very powerful and get involved in policy making in the Jordan Basin in significant ways. And all of the political leaders in, in, in the Palestinian territories in Jordan and in Israel have to be keenly aware of, of what these economic, these are the rent seekers, of what these rent seeking interest groups are trying to achieve in, in water use and in external policy for the countries in which they're uh, operating. They're powerful NGOs and powerful environmental groups too. So you got, you got the full mix in Jordan, Palestine, and, uh, and Israel. Whereas in Egypt and Ethiopia, it's very much kind of state-centric, uh, not with a lot of input from uh, domestic constituencies. Uh, my name is Rocky, and I'm independent. And um, I'm really an outsider to all this discourse on collective action, so just pardon the naive questions. Um, firstly, I want to know how does scale um, change the nature of collective action problems, uh, for example, from international level versus community level like collective action problems. And secondly, um, does subscription to ethical norms uh, ever driver of uh, voluntary compliance beyond any kind of moral claim to legitimacy. Thank you. No, th th those, are, those are excellent questions and, and there are huge debates about scale. I think a basic proposition would be the smaller the group, the better, and the fewer the players, the better. Uh, the, the broader the group, more diverse the membership, the greater the risk of free riding. You don't get noticed as easily. 
Um, so small ethnic group, uh, very conscious of all of its members, uh, maybe patriarchal kind of group where you have a, a central figure or figures who are sort of watching the behavior uh, and keeping up the image of the group and the group's reputation becomes the uh, sort of overriding motive for everybody, you're not going to find a lot of defection. Likewise, in collective action arenas, you can have a few players. If it's a river basin, I'd rather be trying to get collective action among one or two, uh, among two, re two riparians or three riparians as opposed to 12 or 13. Mekong is very complex, the Niger is very complex, the Nile is very complex, and I think all of you know you, you, you don't have complete or effective uh, uh, collective action. So on the moral, yeah, I, I, I quoted the, uh, the Shays. Uh, they think that even at the international level, there is tremendous pressure on, on countries to keep up an image of compliance and honoring, quote, international norms. Um, I, I think the evidence for this is, again, in things like uh, human rights conventions, uh, protection of women, uh, conventions on child labor. Everybody sort of knows that these are things where there are international norms and you at least want to sign on. Now, in practice, those norms may be widely violated. But the image you want to project is, yes, we endorse these. These are our moral values. As they're not just imposed by the United States or some hegemonic power. Uh, and, and so there is great concern. And, and, and naming and shaming can be, can be quite powerful. So you have all these NGOs that monitor compliance with you know, we have Human Rights Watch and, and, and groups like that, and they name and shame. And the way governments react almost immediately to being named and shamed says, this counts. Otherwise, they'd say, oh, I don't care what Human Rights Watch is saying, but instead they issue press releases and, you know, question the facts and, uh, and, and reject the findings. So in that sense, there is a, a kind of moral framework which uh, is, is pretty powerful, I think. Well, I'm, I'm going to take uh, my prerogative as the uh, moderator to ask the last question, which is um, one of the key issues that always come up in uh, the issue of uh, transporting rivers management is power asymmetry. So how do you bring uh, collective action together with power asymmetry. I'm thinking of an example like China, where you have uh, a very powerful country upstream in most of the rivers, uh, uh, the most significant rivers in uh, Asia, international rivers in Asia. How do you, how do you, how do you, um, how does your uh, thinking about collective action, uh, how can it be applied in a case where there is a very dominant upstream riparian, and how can we foster collective action in, in that kind of scenario? You know, I've got my mic on, so I'm <laughs> so reaching for the mic. Um, I mean, that, the, the hegemon is, is the hegemon, and um, there, can be, there can be declining hegemons, and I think a lot of people see the United States in that role. Uh, so who knows 50 years from now uh, what the balance of power will be between Mexico and the United States. But, you know, right now, <laughs> right now, Mexico doesn't have a whole lot of choices. Uh, w they want access to our labor markets, uh, they want access to our markets writ, writ general, and uh, so there's, there, that's not going to change. That's not going to change. And, and in those situations, any, any country in Southeast Asia is going to look at a broad array of policy issues uh, that involve China. And it's going to have to make its cost-benefit calculus across all these areas and decide how important in all these areas is the Mekong, as opposed to more general trade and investment and, and military concerns. 
Uh, and that's going to determine how much you push back or you don't push back. But, I mean, China's a reality. That's, mm -hmm. I feel the same way, um, although it's not, strictly speaking, a collective action problem, but uh, when we look at Iran in, uh, in the Middle East, it is a country of close to 90 million people, highly educated. It's got oil. It's got resources. It's in the neighborhood. It's not going any, to anybody else's neighborhood. People have to deal with it, you know, at some point. Um, and it, it, it's going to be on a whole broad range of, uh, of issues. So, uh, again, I, our, our rational actor models say, let's focus on the Mekong and the water, and, and we do the kind of analysis that, that Dale and, and Mark and Wu Shun did on, on the Nile, and tote up the benefits, and if they're positive, then there should be a case for collective action. Yet, there may be a whole range of other domains where the cost-benefit analysis is completely different. And you say, forget the Mekong. I mean, it's just not, it's not worth the fight. I, I am not suggesting that. I'm just saying, <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, I think Mexico has probably said we got too many other issues with the U.S. Drugs, access to their labor markets, investment. Uh, Colorado isn't worth a drag out fight. They get their way. And some desalinated water. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you, Professor Waterbury, for giving a very um, intellectually stimulating talk today. It's our privilege to have you here. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, you are free to engage Professor Waterbury after this for a little while, but we are moving for dinner, so do it quickly if you are. Thank you very much.